Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to talk about some old world technology and I'm going to try and keep you along my train of thought here so you can see where I was going with this. But what first led me down this path is um, this video that I found, which is from 1896. And this is a artificially intelligence or AI enhanced video from the late 1800s of Manhattan, New York. And I just want to show this to you guys because first of all, it's amazing that we have the abilities and the technology to create this footage. But furthermore, um, I just wanted to look at the trolleys here. And this is what the video is going to be focusing on is this sort of wireless, it appears, trolley. And as you can see, uh, we got smokestacks coming out of these buildings and other things of that nature. So it's relatively cold here in Manhattan. And you see no exhaust coming out of any of these electric trolleys, obviously, because they're electric. So it leads you to ask the question, you know, go to any major city right now and the trolley for the most part, 99% of them are going to be attached to a trolley line, you know, overhead poles. It's going to have a wire much like a, and I hate to use this term, but it seems to be the simplest example that people understand a bumper car. You know, you have a bumper car that has the wire that runs up to the electrified, uh, roof or the electrified, um, metal on top. So that's where it gets its power from. And at any point they can turn the electric cage off, the bumper car stops running. That's basically how the trolleys are nowadays. Uh, they run on overhead electricity, but not the one that we see in Manhattan in 1896. And if you dive into it a little bit, you'll find that these wireless um, trolleyways were actually present all around the world and they stem from a technology that is called the conduit electric system and this is what we're going to talk about today uh really just show a few examples of it try and explain to you how it works and um where the idea for it really came from as well as uh i'm gonna dive into a few examples of some passages that I found describing the different conduit systems. And then, you know, as these things tend to do, one thing leads to another, you find your way working down the rabbit hole and you find something really interesting. So we'll end the video with that. But for right now, we're going to talk about, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, but vernaculars. And these are the ancient, well, not ancient, but you can trace them back to uh, the Middle Ages in different castles and such. Uh, these are the systems of cableways or tracks with a cable built into it that pulls a cart uh, up an incline. So imagine there's a castle on a steep hill or on a mountain and they want to bring troops or they want to bring goods in or out of the castle. They have vernaculars, which are uh, carts that are Basically, they're fixed uh, to the cable, but the cable is built into the track. So it's basically the track itself that appears to be rotating. You, you know what I'm saying there? Uh, sort of reminiscent of the moving sidewalk that they had at the Columbia Exposition, but I digress. So we have these vernaculars that they say were used in the Middle Ages, and there's a lot of them that are still being used today. And... It's a really interesting technology, um, but I talk about those because they say the idea of a fixed cart being moved on a cable um, led itself to the development of the cable railway. And the cable railway, uh, I want to talk about a little bit, predates the uh, steam engine and predates the steam railway. You know, everything that we think about in... Um, the middle of the 1800s that's already pretty convoluted is how we got to the steam engine and the steam railway and all these tracks being everywhere. But predating that to um, the early 1800s, around the 1820s, is the cable railway. 
and the idea for the cable railway is basically uh instead of the cable being visible within the track there's actually a track running and then in the middle of the track almost invisible to the naked eye is a small slit that runs uh, the length of the track and below this slit underground is where the cable is running and this cable is being pulled by and this was this is the part that sort of led me to want to share this this is when i knew we kind of found something uh these cables were being pulled by giant gears that were in the streets you know built into the street corners and such there's basically mechanisms uh pulling these cables around these cities all around the world and they have these underground tunnels and such that were built basically to install these cableways and these massive giant gears and when i say big i mean we're talking up to 20 feet in diameter gears sitting you know under your feet on these roadways in the early 1800s and basically they say that we invented this and we decided this was a good idea that we could use all the advancements in steel and iron production and the such and that's what we did with it we made cable railways all around uh all around and really none of these examples are still uh surviving today the only one that i can think uh in particular of note is in san francisco and you look at the cable cars in san francisco and you think oh that must be a modern technology that these carts are uh these trolley cars as they call them are moving around without wires and they're moving around without any exhaust without any steam or gas or anything like that it must be an advanced modern technology well no it's actually a cable railway technology that's been around since the early 1800s and san francisco is just the only place that it is still in use so literally beneath the streets in san francisco still to this day are giant gears and cableways that are pulling these carts because the carts themselves are basically fixed to the cable they have a, a mechanism that attaches to the cable that they use to accelerate and then there's brakes uh within the cart that the conductor can use but essentially they're fixed to these cableways and the cables are what is being moved beneath the streets of these cities uh so that's where you get or at least the narrative goes that you get these huge tunnelways and these uh beginnings to what would lend to subways in different cities you wonder you know how did they bore all of these subway tunnels uh this is hundreds of years later a hundred years later but they actually repurposed a lot of the old cable railway tunnels and the such and they turned those into the beginnings of the subways in different areas uh but i digress again because what we're looking at here and what I want to get into is the uh, wireless electric railways that we see. And why I discuss the vernaculars and then discuss the cable railways is because as far as the narrative goes, um, around the 1870s into the 1880s, we had another sort of reset when it comes to this transportation and uh, using these rails because we then took the cable railways that had become basically the most popular type of that sort of transportation in the world. We took these cable railways and we tore them down or we revamped them and we took the cables out and we put in a conduit system. Now, basically I wanna keep it in the simplest terms that I can. So this is when you have the introduction of the conduit railway system. The conduit railway system, as the narrative goes, would replace the cable railway system in a lot of these places around the world. And basically they went underground and they took out the cableway and the gears and the such that were running these cable railway systems. And they replaced that with the conduit using the same tracks above and even the same um slit that was down the middle of the road 
uh, they created a new mechanism that they say, as the narrative goes, would now fit through this slit in the middle of the road. And instead of being a grip that would hold on to a cable, it was now um, basically the same technology that you see on the bumper car. But imagine instead of it going above ground and to the roof to a metal cage, it's going below ground uh, to a conduit system or to an electric charge that's being produced below ground. And this was done by creating two very thin tracks that ran for the entire length of the above ground track. And these two very thin tracks consisted of one that was positively charged and one that was negatively charged. And they were placed so close together that the polarity created electricity that could be gathered and garnered by this mechanism that they called a conduit and that was attached to the cart above. So then the carts above could accelerate and they could decelerate using the electricity that was being provided to them by the conduit below. So as above, so below. And you see, and you see that same narrative being given all around the world for the introduction of these conduit electric railways. What I find very interesting to that is that I found these conduit electric railways, or at least examples of them, uh, a lot of people call them trolleys, but they have to be underground railways when you see them running through different forests and things of that nature. And you just wonder who or how long ago did they really dig out the tunnel below to lay down the conduit? I know that there were other technologies around at the time. You could say possibly that it was powered with battery uh, electricity rather than a conduit underground. But I found multiple pictures from the 1800s and I'll try and include them that appear to show these different conduit systems in use in the middle of what you would think to be wildland. So how, how were these photographs possible? And furthermore, how was this technology being installed, they say, from the 1870s through the 1880s and then by the 1900s you have most if not all of these systems beginning to be torn down and replaced with the overhead trolley and different forms of transportation like the automobile and other oil powered engines that would benefit those at the top is the easiest way to say it so you just have to question the narrative and really these electric conduit systems only survived in a few places all around the world they began as far back as budapest in the 1800s and this mysterious system they say was the one that all the other conduit systems were modeled after but then you have them popping up in in paris and new york and all of these old world the major cities that you've seen mentioned for hundreds of years and you just have to wonder why nowadays in a lot of these places you see the overhead trolleys and a boatload of traffic everywhere and congestion and it really has taken away from the beauty of these cities where we had once electric conduit systems and cable railway systems that were a lot easier on the eye and really lended themselves to a sort of old world technology so that's what I wanted to discuss first in this video. Let me know your thoughts below. And I just want to wrap up the video with this article I found. And this is from 1903. And it postulates to a article that they ran in 1901. But the gist of this is about the Manhattan Conduit Electric Railway. And what the story basically implies is that this conduit railway system was inherited or that whoever constructed it passed it on to a group of people who had foreseen problems and expected to experience different uh, mishaps with the system and that they had different things in place to deal with it when this occurred. It's just a very convoluted story that also goes on to explain that the whole conduit system in Manhattan in New York ran on 11,000 volts 
which would have made it the most powerful conduit system in the entire world. And uh, the story echoes that, discussing how it probably is the largest and most complex conduit system in the entire world. And then it also goes on to say that there's roughly on every corner a uh, conduit station, so to speak, that supplies over 15,000 kilowatts of power, which they say is more power than that is supplied by small power plants in different cities all around the world. And they had multiple of these on basically every street in Manhattan just for this conduit system. So I thought that was interesting and needed to be shared by itself. But at the end of this article and uh, in some other articles that I read from this time around the 1900s, they talk about a man and a type of engine that all these companies were looking into. And so I had to dive into who this gentleman was and his history was worth a minute or two. We're gonna take a look at Leon Serpoyer. He was born in 1858 in France and he is known for the flash steam boiler engine, which at first was used just to power lights, but eventually became known as an engine that could power automobiles, trikes, boats, cars, trams, trolleys, and even omnibuses. They give this man credit for creating over 100 flash steam boiler tramsways in Paris in 1897, as well as the Phaeton automobile that ran completely on flash steam. He also created double decker tramways so think of the like above ground trolleys that you see and now think of one that's double decker in in the late 1800s early 1900s and it's powered by a steam boiler engine to get a little bit into what a steam boiler engine is uh it basically looks like a big um medieval times cooking pot with an exhaust pipe coming out of it. But what's going on within is that there is a very small, tiny amount of water inside, and that is being heated up to the point that it is creating steam. And inside this pot, the steam is pressurized. It is compressed, very, very compressed, to the point that it is used then to push the vehicle or the device that the engine is on forward or to push forward the mechanism in which needs to be powered. So not only could you power a vehicle with this sort of boiler steam, but you could even power light bulbs, they say, with a sort of boiler steam. And the ingenious part about it is it took a minimal amount of water and a minimal amount of lighting source or kerosene or whatever sort of oil you were using to light and keep the heat um they're saying that you could travel over six miles on less than an ounce of water so look at it as you might but it's a very interesting technology now not only was this technology advanced for the time and was very cost efficient as well as it doesn't sound like it would be that safe but as far as the wiki goes they're saying it was one of the safest of the the quote-unquote combustible engines being developed at the time um these engines these flash steam boiler engines were also the fastest in the entire world um these were put into automobiles, which set the land speed record first in 1902 in an automobile called the Easter Egg. Uh, it went 75 miles per hour. And this is in 1902 when other automobiles were barely able to hit 50. This thing was going 75. Uh, if that isn't impressive, in 1903, uh, Leon Serpoyer went back with a steam boiler engine and went 100 miles per hour in 1903, setting a land speed record that would stand for quite a while as far as automobiles go. Now, he also presented his work at the Commercial Motor Show in Olympia, 
I'm just going to name drop these different places if you want to look into them because I assume there's bountiful information that I haven't gotten to yet. And he also exhibited his first flash steam boiler steamboat at the Steamboat Exhibition in Monaco. Now, throughout his lifetime, Leon Serpoyer was promoted to the Order of the Lion and the Sun, which is one of the highest orders uh, of gentlemanly order in the entire world. And he was also a member of the Legion of Honor. And when he died in the early 1900s, they say his obituaries basically called him the greatest contributor to automobiles and transportation of all time. Of all time. So it leads me to wonder where exactly and how much of his inventions were being used because for him to be considered the greatest of all time is 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 quite a lot but you see this echoed throughout his wikipedia page and throughout these obituaries that were written now what's crazier about this is he died mysteriously they say of a malignant disease at the young age of 48 and with him died the idea for the flash steam boiler engine it, it basically went out of service no one developed it further after he died and within a few years of his death the gasoline powered model t ford automobile would become the reigning automobile throughout the world and gas would become the main thing that we would be using to power automobiles so you already know probably how I feel about that whole story, but I wanted to share it with you because Leon Serpoyer is someone that I had never really heard of before, and he seems like a very important figure that was sort of erased from our past. So anyway, I want to wrap up the video there. I hope everything here was interesting to you. I thank you so much for being here. Please leave your thoughts and comments below. Subscribe if you're not already. If you're still here with me, watch the video, leave a like, and I'll see you on the next one.